order. It is now time for questions to the Minister for Employment and Learning, and we will start with listed questions. Question one has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Mr. Eastwood. Uh, question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, members are aware that I, I have initiated a review into the teacher training infrastructure in Northern Ireland. The review panel uh, invited each of the initial teacher uh, education institutions to submit their views on structures necessary to create a world-class system of initial teacher education in Northern Ireland. The panel also invited submissions from other interested stakeholders. This has provided an opportunity for staff, if they so wished, to make their views known to the panel. The closing date for submissions was 18 December. Over 100 responses were received. All responses received have been passed on to the panel. My officials have prepared a summary report of the responses, which will be published on my department's website shortly. The review panel has recently met with the initial teacher education providers and a number of other interested stakeholders. They will draw the information from these meetings together with all other relevant information to inform their final report. Once this assignment has been completed, it will form the basis for further dialogue with the various institutions with the intention of finding an agreed way forward. Call Mr. Eastwood. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the, the Minister for, for his answer? Can I ask him, though, has this department uh, had any estimates yet, uh, undertaken any estimates of how uh, current staffing levels at the existing colleges at the moment uh, would be affected by this review? Well, it's not an issue we have explored uh, to date. Uh, the member will appreciate we're at, at the second stage uh, of, of a process, uh, and that is looking at the options uh, for uh, the, the, uh, the potential reconfiguration uh, of the current uh, structures, and we're expecting a number of options uh, in that regard. But the member can take reassurance, as can others, that we have uh, always sought to engage with all relevant stakeholders at each stage in the process, and uh, if and when we get to the, the point of actual concrete proposals for change, we will of course uh, be seeking uh, to engage with, with the institutions who in turn uh, will seek to engage with their staff over, over those uh, potential way forwards. Well, Mr. Fran McCann. Uh, uh, last Kim Kulia, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I would like to put on record my continuing support for the retention of St Mary's College, uh, University College, but regarding the various school sectors in the North, i.e. controlled, Catholic maintained, integrated and Irish medium, were each of the representative bodies consulted by the review team in the form of face-to-face -face meetings? Well, the, uh, the, the panel uh, did invite submissions uh, from uh, right across the community and a number of those organisations did not in fact respond in writing uh, and uh, a number of those were also subject to direct uh, meetings. So there has been a detailed engagement with all of the relevant stakeholders uh, and, and the type of organisations that the member has outlined were very much part of that process. Call Mr Jim Allister. Has the Minister any concerns about how this matter was handled within Stranmillis College where an academic leadership team uh, prepared a draft uh, then the draft was changed under the Minister's appointee, the Chairman of the Board of Governors, without reference back to that team, and then uh, it was submitted without them knowing its contents, and Could then question, the panel please. visited the University on the 24th of February without the staff being told, and there's been no feedback to the staff. Does that strike the Minister as the level of consultation order, that order, with please. staff? I must insist that the question is put. Well, I'm grateful to the member uh, for his uh, rather elongated question, but the, the issues that he has outlined are matters uh, for uh, Stranmillis as a, an institution. Uh, it is the, the Board of Governors that has the responsibility uh, for um, running uh, the college, and it's with the Board of Governors uh, that the department uh, has the direct liaison uh, on, on such matters. Uh, but Stranmillis have been fully engaged in the process uh, to date. Uh, we have received a detailed submission uh, from them. They have been also uh, awarded a, a more detailed face-to-face uh, -face meeting uh, with the panel, and they will be a key uh, delivery partner in terms of the way forward. Call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number three, please. Uh, entitlement to housing benefit is a matter for the Department for Social Development. Some students in full-time education may be eligible for housing benefit depending upon their individual circumstances. 
Hello, my department does not uh, provide specific housing benefit. It provides a range of other financial assistance to students undertaking vocational courses at further education colleges. There are two main sources of support uh, for their education awards, which are, are administered by Student Finance Northern Ireland, and hardship funds, which are administered by each uh, further education college. FE awards provide a maintenance grant to assist with, with living costs for full-time and part-time students over 19 who are undertaking an approved vocational FE course up to level 3. Hardship funds are administered by each FE college. They provide support to learners over 18 years of age who are experiencing exceptional financial difficulty with meeting costs associated with learning while enrolled in an FE college. The funds are aimed specifically at providing assistance with fees, books and equipment, travel costs and associated living costs. Students can apply for assistance from both sources with a maximum amount payable capped at £3,500 per year. Students attending full-time higher education level 4 or level 5 courses at a college may be entitled to a maintenance loan and means-tested maintenance grant to help with living costs. Funding for childcare costs is also available to eligible students who have dependent children. Eligibility for assistance from further education awards and or uh, college hardship funds is not based on the receipt of prescribed benefits but on a number of criteria such as means, tested, uh, uh, such as means test based on house, household income. Over the three academic years, the financial support provided through FE awards was just over at 4.5 million, 4.6 million and 5.5 million respectively, and through the hardship fund around 2 million, 1.8 million and 1.7 million in each year. Mr. Agnew. I, I thank the Minister for his answers and his, his outline of the supports available for, for students who find themselves in, in hardship. Um, I am aware of a case in, in our mutual constituency um, of a young person who is facing such hardship. Um, unfortunately, is estranged from their parents and um, is, is struggling to, to, to meet costs and seek housing. Could I ask the Minister, he mentioned the, the Further Education Award was um, for those over 19. Could he tell me the rationale for that uh, setting the, the, the level at that age group? Uh, well, the, the rationale will, will predate my uh, term in office, um, and, but it is something we are uh, happy to, to, to take a look at. And if the member is, has a specific case in mind, and um, given I'm from the same constituency, I may have an idea what that case would be, um, we, will, we would be happy to take a more detailed look at that uh, at a departmental level uh, if the member uh, does want to, to get di uh, directly in touch to ensure that, that any individual uh, is fully aware of the potential sources of support that are available uh, to them uh, and it's important that someone does consider all of the potential sources uh, that, are, that are out there. Mr Phil Flanagan. I'll ask and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, does the Minister accept that there is a, a serious problem um, for students at the minute with um, problems accessing affordable housing whilst they're at college and can the Minister give us an update as to what he's trying to do to address this problem? Well, the, the member will be aware that issues uh, relating to housing are primarily an issue uh, for my colleague, the, the Minister uh, for uh, Social Development. However, uh, I do have uh, responsibilities to ensure that we uh, are able uh, to have accessibility to both higher education and uh, further education, and as such, uh, we do have a widening participation uh, strategy. Um, I'm happy to have more detailed discussions uh, with uh, Nelson McCausland uh, around uh, such matters. Um, depending on the particular course, I mean, there is support available in terms uh, of, uh, of maintenance, and the member will also be interested to note that we are conducting uh, a review in relation to higher education uh, finance uh, issues, uh, not the issues of tuition fees, I, I hasten uh, to, to stress, uh, but some of the other issues relating to, to for example, part-time study, and indeed some of the anomalies that have occurred in our system as we move to different systems across, across the UK. Mrs Dolores Kelly. Speaker, the Minister gave very detailed answers to the initial question, but could he maybe expand a bit further on the right of appeal in relation to the Hardship Fund and if, whether or not he has any plans to link EMA to housing status? Well, 
the, 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 someone wishes to, to take forward an appeal, uh, they're, they're, they're entitled uh, to do so. On the issue of EMA, that has been subject to its own uh, review, and indeed we had a public consultation on uh, that matter. It's something that uh, responsibility is shared between my department and the Department of, of Education, and it has been taken to the executive, and we have a, a, an agreed uh, policy outcome in that regard. And it is worth stressing that we have a, a more generous form of EMA support in Northern Ireland than any other of the, of the uh, regions or nations uh, within uh, the UK, and that's a clear example of the importance of devolution to actually delivering for, for local people. Mr. William Comfrey for question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. The Shankill uh, Job Assist Centre has delivered the Local Employment Intermediary Service, otherwise known as LEMAS, on behalf of my department in the Greater Shankill area since April 2007, when the contract was awarded following a competitive tendering exercise. Following on from the success uh, of LEMAS, uh, LEMAS 2 has been operational since April 2011. Since November 2012, LEMAS providers uh, have also been encouraged to caseload uh, young people aged 16 to 24, uh, not in education, training or employment, as an early intervention measure in support of the Executive's Pathway to Success strategy. The current LEMAS contracts will come to an end early in 2015 at which point there will be a review of policy options to determine the way forward. All LEMAS providers will be evaluated as part of the Pathways to Success strategy evaluation, and a full modular evaluation report should be completed by June 2014. Shankill Job Assist Centre is also involved in delivering the contract for the Community Family Support Programme, partly funded through the Delivering Social Change Initiative, following a competitive tendering exercise in September 2013. Five lead organisations and a range of partners have been awarded contracts to deliver the programme to at least uh, 720 families across Northern Ireland uh, between October 2013 and March 2015. In addition, the department offers, uh, offered funding for the uh, promoting employability in the Greater Shankill project, amounting to uh, £101,000 from the European Social Fund, which is 40% of the project costs and a, uh, a 63,000 contribution by my department, meeting 25% of the project costs. The remaining 35% match funding is provided by a combination of the department's LEMAS programme and impact training at NI Limited. The funding is offered over a two-year period from the 1st of April 2013 to at the end of March 2015. The Shankill Job Assist Centre has demonstrated its ability and experience to secure contracts to deliver services for those most in need, and I look forward to maintaining that partnership within this context. Mr Humphrey, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive uh, answer to the question. Uh, the Minister will have visited the Spectrum Centre for the 10-year anniversary of Job Assist only a few weeks ago with myself and party colleagues. Um, he will know the valuable work that Job Assist are doing in the areas that he's mentioned here today, along with impact training, and I pay tribute to both of them in this, in this House. C can the Minister agree with me, or does the Minister agree with me, that he mentions local in his reply, that the Shankill Job Assist are not just simply working with people in the Greater Shankill, but across indeed North and West Belfast, and indeed across the City of Belfast, and that their work is invaluable? I thank the member for his, his supplementary and the comments uh, that he has made, and, and I endorse uh, what he has said. Um, first of all, it is important that we, we look to uh, local uh, delivery, particularly at, at, a, at a community level, uh, in relation to a number of our employment uh, programmes. And uh, I would pay tribute to the success of Shankill Job Assist Centre uh, in that regard. And the member will know that some of the figures of, in terms of performance uh, are actually quite dramatic in terms of their success rate. Uh, and and uh, I think it is a real tribute to all of those who have been involved uh, in that regard. Um, ca can I stress that uh, as we look to the future, there will be uh, a number of other uh, programmes that uh, my department uh, will be uh, rolling out. Uh, and in relation to those, we will be looking uh, for bids coming in uh, from the community and voluntary sector uh, to take those, those forward. Because uh, particularly whenever we're developing new policy, uh, it's always good to try to pilot and to, uh, to experiment with uh, innovative uh, approaches. Uh, and I would fully encourage and indeed expect uh, applications to be coming in from Shankill Job Assist in that regard. Mr. Trevor Lunn is not in his place. I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Question number six, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Department addresses sickness absence through a robust application of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and Efficiency Sickness Absence Policy and Procedures, and by providing a range of support services and interventions to assist all of its employees to improve their general health and well-being. 
The Department has developed a Managing Attendance Action Plan aimed at reducing absence levels through a range of mechanisms which focus on governance, well-being, strategies and stakeholder responsibilities. The plan includes divisional absence targets, early interventions and stress cases, a partnership approach to case management between Human Resources Branch and line managers, and delivering a range of health and well-being initiatives in partnership with the Northern Ireland Civil Service Well Programme. In addition, the Department has sought to change its attendance culture and issues regular communications to line managers and staff to reinforce their roles and responsibilities and to ensure that there is a commitment to collaborative working on this issue. Managers are encouraged to attend training to develop the knowledge and skills required to deal with absence management. An e-learning package on managing sickness absence is scheduled to be delivered to all staff within the department in the coming weeks. Staffing profiles of individual departments are a contributory factor to their differing levels of absence. This is particularly relevant to my department, which has high numbers of female staff, frontline services and administrative grades, all of which have traditionally contributed to high absence levels. When the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency adjusted the data in the 2011-12 year for comparison based on these factors, this would have improved the, the uh, departmental position from 11.4 to 9 days. The absence rate in the department has been reduced from 17.7 days in 2003 and 2004 to 11.5 days in 2012 and 13, and the expected outturn for 2013 and 14 is estimated at, at 10.2 days. I would congratulate the staff on their efforts to date, and the Department is committed to building on the progress that has been made so far. I call Mr Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response and the work that has been done. But given that the Department of Employment and Learning is one of the highest departments in the sickness absence days, can the Minister advise if the Department or if he has any intention of carrying out an internal audit into this for to try and reduce uh, this whole issue further down? Well, in terms of audit, the member will be conscious that it's something that the Northern Ireland Office, uh, Audit Office itself uh, takes a very uh, keen interest in, and that isn't entirely appropriate given that there is a, a significant uh, financial cost uh, to uh, to the Northern Ireland budget uh, from a sickness, a sickness absence. Now, it's something that will never be entirely uh, driven out of any organisation, but there is a recognition that our levels um, are uh, too high, uh, judged by uh, compared, com comparisons with other uh, types of organisation in, in, in different sectors and indeed in other parts of these islands and, and, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, so while we do have some historic patterns uh, of sickness, it is something that we do have to be very proactive in trying to, to combat, because it is important uh, both for, for taxpayers and indeed also uh, for, for customer service. Well, Mr Fergal McKinney. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Uh, Minister, can I ask you what, uh, in what you've outlined, will it be sufficient uh, in terms of future-proofing the Department in terms of mental health-related illness? Well, in terms of, of, of look, looking to the future, uh, I am pleased uh, that um, we are making progress uh, in the, the right areas. Uh, and um, the member is also right to draw attention uh, to the issue of, of mental health. Uh, often, um, we, we view sickness purely in terms of, of physical issues, and it is appropriate that um, we also extend the same consideration to mental health um, issues. Of course, mental health issues can cover a very broad spectrum in terms of, of conditions. And I think what is important is that we offer support uh, to people uh, with varying mental health conditions to remain uh, in, in the workplace. And I do believe that through cooperation in particular uh, with a number of organisations in the community and voluntary sector, that we are becoming more sophisticated in, in that regard. Mr Sammy Wilson is not in his place. I call Mr. Ian Milne. Kester question number eight. Uh, our further and higher education institutions have developed programmes and ways of teaching that give students an insight into entrepreneurship and embed the skills of enterprise. There is some confusion on the meaning of the terms entrepreneurship and enterprise, and I would like to clarify how my department uses these terms. In an educational sense, I believe that enterprise is about developing enterprising individuals who have personal attributes to enable them to make unique, innovative and creative contributions to the world of work, whether in employment or self-employment. On the other hand, entrepreneurship is supporting those who wish to establish a business. 
or further on higher education institutions address both of these areas in providing for their students. For example, Belfast Metropolitan College offers students an exciting award-winning creativity programme named FRESH, designed to inspire and motivate them uh, to, to problem-solve through a creative process and to, to embed enterprising behaviours as an outcome. Other colleges have similar and innovative ways of encouraging students to acquire an enterprising spirit, uh, which for some can develop into a desire to become entrepreneurs. The best awards, which were introduced in May 2011 by Colleges NI, were designed to celebrate the creativity and innovation of the sector, and in particular to recognise the, the excellent project based learning taking place across the colleges. In an increasingly competitive labour market, higher education institutions must provide graduates with opportunities to develop a portfolio of skills, attributes, and experiences that will set them apart in the world of employment, and this very much includes entrepreneurship. Call Mr. Milne for supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer thus far. I could ask the Minister, does the Minister uh, know if there is much of a difference in the numbers of students in further education and higher education who start their own business? Well, I, th I think it's, it's fair to say that we don't have enough people across the board in Northern Ireland yet who are establishing uh, their own uh, business. Uh, and insofar as we are being successful in terms of providing uh, people with the right skills uh, for uh, employers as such. Um, we, we don't yet have enough people who are prepared to go out and, and to start uh, their own business. It's not as, as much a part of our culture as it is in some other societies. So it is important that we try to engender that type of, of culture uh, right through careers advice, uh, through to both further education colleges and higher education colleges, uh, higher education institutions uh, offering that type of support. I would draw attention uh, to some of the very innovative work that's happening within further education, where more and more students are being supported uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the creation of a business, and indeed we're encouraging businesses to come to further education and uh, try to find um, research uh, uh, gaps to, to, for, the, for them to be addressed. Uh, and I believe through that type of collaboration, we will actually encourage more of the students themselves uh, to, to go into business directly. Call Mr. Alistair Ross. Mr. Deputy Speaker, one of the best ways to inspire and encourage young people is through the use of role models. Can I ask the Minister if there is any thought being given to perhaps working with Invest Northern Ireland to establish local role models who can help to inspire young people to either start up their own businesses or get involved in some innovative uh, ideas? Well, I think those are discussions that we would be very happy to take forward uh, with uh, Invest uh, Northern Ireland. Of course, they have the, the primary lead in the area of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, and there are a number uh, of mentoring programmes that are in existence uh, at present. Uh, they tend to be concentrated more on those who are slightly beyond uh, the stage of actually being uh, within the college or uh, university setting. And I, I would agree with the member that is a, a potential area where we can actually do a little bit more work in terms of actually bringing in business more directly uh, to encourage particular individuals who are showing a flair uh, for entrepreneurship. Call Mrs. Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, indeed, uh, connections between businesses and the further and higher education uh, institutions is really important. And I, I'm just wondering, is there something more that those institutions can do to to be more welcoming and to be more to listen more to to the businesses, uh, to help improve those connections and to inspire young people more in business? Well, I thank the member for her question, and maybe if we broaden it slightly beyond the issue of direct support in terms of entrepreneurship and talk about the, the role and relevance of universities and colleges uh, for the economy, uh, we can then look to, for example, the higher education uh, strategy, uh, which places uh, what universities can do uh, to support uh, the economy uh, at, a, at a centrepiece. There's a whole range of ways in which businesses should be interacting with both universities and colleges, and that includes uh, advice in terms of the content uh, of, of curriculum uh, through to uh, providing placements uh, for students to gain invaluable uh, work experience. One of the most critical areas where we uh, do need to, to improve is in terms of employability skills. Our colleges and universities can provide the knowledge or, and, and, or, and or technical skills that are required, uh, but the employability skills can't really be taught in, in a vacuum. Uh, it's important that businesses do work in collaboration uh, with our institutions uh, to provide those work placements in particular. Well, Mr. Declan McAleer for a question. Kaisa uh, question nine. 
Uh, my department offers a wide range of provision to help both the unemployed and employers in all sectors, including the sustainable energy and energy efficiency sectors, to equip their workforce with the right skills to help drive their businesses. For example, the Further Education Colleges provide a range of courses specific to the needs of the sustainable energy sector, which may assist those who are unemployed to gain qualifications or develop skills in areas such as renewable energy production or technologies. This includes foundation degrees specialising in wind technology and renewable energies. Colleges offer, also offer a variety of professional and technical courses at different levels that are relevant to the renewable energy sector. Courses cover topics such as solar energy, sustainable business practices, uh, responsible sourcing of materials, biomass heating systems and wind turbine specification and installation. I recognise the importance of high-grade welding skills to not just the sustainable energy and energy efficiency sectors, but to the wider engineering industry in Northern Ireland. A range of training to Level 3 standard is available through the Further Education College Network to provide the accredited qualifications the sector needs. In addition, the Assured Skills Programme provided 140,000 funding to upskill two Belfast Metropolitan College lecturers and train four NVQ assessors in wind turbine maintenance to upskill a further five lecturers in hydraulics training relevant to the renewable sector and to develop Level 3 hydraulics qualifications with City and Guilds. Mr. McGillier, for supplementary. Uh, uh, would the Minister agree that uh, a community employment scheme in the sector would, would not only be a very, very effective way of addressing the issue of energy, energy and efficiency, but also that of unemployment? Well, we have a number uh, of schemes uh, at present that are trying to address uh, the issue of um, unemployment. In particular, we have the, the Youth uh, Employment uh, Scheme. Uh, we also want to work uh, in, in collaboration with employers around uh, their, their training needs. Uh, and in particular, we have the, the Skills Solution Service, uh, which is a one-stop shop uh, for em employers to talk through and find the, the most appropriate scheme in terms of uh, attracting and uh, training uh, their required staff. Also, Bridge to Employment uh, offers a means uh, by which uh, unemployed people uh, can be attracted into businesses and provided with the, the relevant skills uh, to, to be taken forward. Uh, I think also as we look to the future, in particular under the review of public administration, uh, at a more localised level uh, through the, the future community planning uh, powers that councils will have, I think the opportunity will be there to, to better scope skill levels at a local level and to engage with the relevant uh, FE colleges that serve those areas around the, the very particular aspects of, of the economy in different parts of Northern Ireland. Mr Mervyn, story for a question. Question number 10, Mr Devis. The Area Planning Steering Group's role is to coordinate and oversee the continuing development of the Education and Library Board's area plans to embed a single approach to area planning for schools. The Department has been represented at the last three meetings of the Area Planning Steering Group to ensure that the planning process takes account of the provision at further education colleges. Area planning should make full use of effective partnership working that, that exists already between schools and further education colleges. This will help to ensure that the education system can respond to the needs of pupils and the skills required in growing the economy. For example, in considering accommodation and innovative approaches to curriculum delivery, consideration should be taken of further education colleges' state-of-the-art buildings, equipment, expertise and local, um, local employer knowledge. These are all available for use by schools to make their curriculum provided through the entitlement framework stimulating for pupils and relevant to the world of work. I believe that the policy for 14 to 19 year old school pupils should seek to address the core issues of access to a full, relevant and motivating curriculum that has an appropriate balance between high quality academic and vocational provision. My department's input into the work of the area planning steering group can help to ensure that the important contribution that further education sector can make is recognised and utilised to the full. Mr Storey for supplementary. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and thank the Minister for his answer. In working out the uh, policy implications in relation to the involvement now of his department on the steering group, can the Minister expa expand somewhat in regards to how those working relationships will translate into capital projects? Because I'm well aware that he has currently money that he has to spend. I'm well aware of capital money that is proposed to be spent in the Department of Education. And is there any meeting of minds so that the maximum amount of benefit is gained as a result of a substantial amount of capital provision being made within 
the two departments. Can well, I ask the Minister to be I'm brief, very please? I am happy uh, to have uh, th those conversations. And the Member is quite right to, to stress the importance of trying to coordinate uh, what, what we are doing. Um, what I want to ensure is that we are offering a rounded uh, offer uh, to, to our young people, which includes both academic and vocational uh, alternatives. And in many respects, the, the, the FE system has the economies of scale uh, to provide a more effective uh, vocational offer than that, that, will, that could be offered within uh, the school system. And as we look to, to the future in terms of area planning, I think it's important that full recognition is made of the opportunities that exist within the FE sector, rather than resources being diverted into trying to replicate what is happening in the FE sector and actually duplicating uh, the, the, the uh, provision that we, that we can already have at the expense of doing something more effective uh, with those resources. But I'm confident through effective engagement within the structures that we can actually have a solution that actually works for the best interests of young people right across the board. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Mr. Right. McMullen. Minister, can I ask the Minister for his reaction to a report published by Robert Salisbury, which indicated that industrial relations within the six further education colleges are not fit for purpose? Well, um, I very much welcome uh, the report from uh, Sir Robert uh, Salisbury, and hopefully it does provide a, a new beginning in terms of uh, relations, uh, human resources re uh, relations within uh, the, the FE sector. It is important to stress that it was Colleges and I that took forward the commissioning of this report and has, re has reported uh, to them. So, so this is not something that has been imposed upon the sector. It's indeed something that the sector was actually quite proactive in taking forward with themselves. And the member will uh, recall that. Uh, such a process was, was one of the, the recommendations in, uh, arising from the McConnell report uh, into the, to the industrial relations situation uh, in North West Regional College. Mr. McMullen for supplementary. Can I, can I thank the Minister for, a, for his answer? The current system as described in the report is largely ineffective and dysfunctional, and a complete overall has been recommended. Is this something the Minister uh, will seek to implement? Well, uh, the member will be aware of this, uh, 17 different recommendations that are contained uh, within uh, the, the Salisbury report, and I believe holistically uh, those uh, recommendations will uh, create a, a, a new beginning in terms of, of industrial relations. Indeed, colleges, uh, colleges and I are happy uh, to, to endorse uh, the recommendations that they have, have received, and they are now engaging uh, with the various stakeholders with respect to implementation of those. So I am happy uh, with both the content of that report and indeed the commitment uh, to deliver upon it recommendations. Mr. Fergal McKinney for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Given that in 2012, 13-46% of uh, Northern Ireland domicile students at UK higher education institutions were either uh, engaged in a, a broad STEM subject or 23% or in a narrow STEM subject, what is the Minister doing to encourage more people to stay here in the North and benefit the economy here? Well, well, first of all, the member is right to put uh, emphasis upon uh, STEM subjects, uh, and indeed, um, uh, tomorrow I'm, I'm heading to the United States uh, to talk uh, with uh, the U.S. State Department and indeed a, a number of, of different organisations to see how we can further explore opportunities uh, for, for the United States uh, government and indeed businesses uh, to support uh, our STEM agenda uh, locally. In terms of creating the, the space and opportunity for more uh, training and education in, in STEM, we have taken forward a number of initiatives. First of all, we have expanded uh, the number of uh, university places by uh, 1,350 uh, through to 2015-16, uh, and all of those are in, in STEM subjects. Uh, we have also uh, doubled uh, the number of publicly supported uh, PhDs in Northern Ireland. Again, all of those are in areas of, of economic relevance. And the member will also be aware that we are uh, currently concluding a major uh, review of apprenticeship and the idea there is to make sure that we are uh, providing a, a form of, of advanced vocational training uh, that is highly relevant to the world of work. And as our economy uh, moves more and more into STEM-related areas, I expect the, the, the form of apprenticeship training uh, will, will reflect that, 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 that change itself. Mr McKinney for supplementary. Thank, I thank the Minister. Um, uh, and I wonder, could he give his assessment of uh, uh, schemes like the Free Graduate Boot Camp that the University of Ulster is running and what impact that could potentially have in encouraging uh, um, uh, students to stay or to try and compete in the labour market here. 
Um, there's a lot of very good initiatives that are being, uh, being taken forward. Um, whether it's by the University of Ulster, whether it's by Queen's University, the Open University, or indeed uh, our, our schools and uh, further education uh, colleges. Uh, indeed, whenever uh, representatives from the US government uh, visited us at the end of January, uh, they were very impressed uh, by the commitment and some of the initiatives that were being taken forward. I think where the challenge lies uh, locally is to scale those up and to, to, to expand those to ensure we have more and more young people who are going through those type of experiences and are getting a real love of, of science and technology and engineering, and it's through that type of, of approach that we will increase the number of locally, locally based people who are able to actually provide the jobs of the new economy. Mr Jim Wells for a topical question. I hope the Minister, before he jets off to the United States, will find time to congratulate Kelly Gallagher on her outstanding success at the Olympics, particularly as a North Down member. But could I ask the Minister, to alluding to the question asked by Mr Alistair earlier, when the review of the future of Stranvillis College is concluded, can he give us a cast-on guarantee that the ethos of Stranvillis, which is so important to many people in this province, is retained? Well, um I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be doing a, a detour to, to, to Sochi in terms of the, uh, the flight plan uh, to, uh, to the United States. Um, but certainly I, I would uh, join the member in passing on uh, my congratulations on what is an, uh, an outstanding uh, achievement uh, for, for both Bangor and indeed uh, Northern Ireland as a whole. In terms of, of the way forward uh, for uh, t teacher education, um, we are looking to have a, a rounded solution uh, that meets the needs of Northern Ireland society as a whole. And it's my firm belief that we have to have a system of, of, of teacher training in which any individual can be trained to work in any type of school um, and, and indeed any particular sector within our education system. And I believe there's a number of different formats in which that can be uh, achieved. Whenever the member makes reference to the ethos of Stranmillis, I would actually stress that Stranmillis itself isn't and shouldn't be viewed as being an exclusive training college for the controlled sector. Uh, while its enrolment figures uh, may be a majority Protestant, uh, they are actually much more diverse than people uh, would actually, uh, maybe at first uh, thought, actually uh, rec recognise. And indeed, their ethos is very much one uh, of sharing and actually providing teachers for, for right across the spectrum of, of provision. Bells for supplementary. I say that I know from personal experience he's absolutely right. Stan Millis is extremely mixed. But the difference is, of course, it's not a Catholic teacher training college like St Mary's. And there is a concern. There is a concern that this merger could lead to a diminution of the tradition of Stamilis, which is so important well, and has created so many good questions, teachers. Please. In, in some ways, I think the, the, the member is right, first of all, that we shouldn't be drawing or seeking to draw a parallel between Stranmanis and St Mary's. Uh, it, it often happens, but they, they aren't established in, in, this, in the same manner. They have diff, different histories. Indeed, uh, they have uh, a, a number of different traditions that have built up uh, of, over time, and they have different forms uh, of, of, of governance. Um, I think what is important, again, I stress this point, that Stranmanis should be there uh, today for the, the entire spectrum of, of facilities, of, of, of teaching of, of schools. There are a number of anomalies in the system uh, where there is a sense of injustice in terms of equal opportunities, and there, there are things I do want to see addressed on the back of the current uh, review into, into the teacher training uh, infrastructure. But it's important that we look towards a shared future and ensure that we have a teacher training system in Northern Ireland that's very much in keeping with that type of ethos. Call Mr. Chris Hazard for a topical question. Um, given the, the recent crisis and our ongoing crisis in our A&E uh, departments, can I ask the minister to outline what discussions he's had with the health minister over the training and maintaining of our emergency doctors here in the north? Well, I haven't had any uh, direct uh, conversations uh, with my counterpart, uh, the health minister, uh, in, in that regard. Uh, but the members should be aware that. The, the, the setting of those numbers is very much a matter uh, for the, the Department of Health, and indeed uh, they will part fund uh, the training uh, of, of doctors uh, within uh, our, our, our local system. So I, I would encourage the member to, to maybe direct those type of comments to, to, to the Minister of Health, but I fully understand that the point that he's trying to make. Mr Hazard for supplementary. 
Can and thank the Minister indeed for his answer thus far. Uh, and I take on board the points the Minister has made. Uh, in light of the comments, uh, what can your department do uh, in, in, in order to increase the numbers of doc emergency doctors that we do train, and most importantly, maintain and indeed maybe recruit back from places like Australia, uh, where we're seeing a large number of our emergency doctors uh, fleeing to? Well, what we can commit to is, in the event uh, that there is uh, greater funding coming from the Department of Health in this regard, and it's, it's for the, the Health Minister to make that judgment as to whether, whether or not that, that's appropriate or, or not, uh, we can respond in terms of the, the institutional setting uh, for, uh, for that. And as the member will know, we have a new uh, Vice Chancellor of Queen's uh, University, who very much uh, is, is a, comes from a, a medical. Uh, background, uh, so those issues will very much be, be, be to the forefront. But from my uh, knowledge, beyond my particular remit as uh, Minister for Employment and Learning, I don't think the issue is purely one of the numbers of doctors that are being trained, it's actually ensuring that the doctors that are trained are attracted in uh, to working in the field of accident and emergency as opposed to other types of specialities. Mr Sean Rogers for topical questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, could I ask you what discussions have you had with your counterpart in the South, and what discussions have taken place between you, CAST, and CEO about the, the uh, perceived inequality with, with the CEO system that prevents students from the North accessing third level degree courses in the South? Uh, yes, I mean, this is a, an ongoing issue. Uh, and indeed, it's, it's an issue of, of deep concern to both myself and uh, John O'Dowd, the Minister uh, for Education. The member will be aware that a number, uh, two universities, uh, Trinity College and uh, Dublin City University, have recently relaxed uh, their entry uh, requirements to more readily facilitate applications uh, from uh, Northern Ireland. I am also aware that uh, uh, University College Galway uh, is also um, considering uh, making uh, similar moves. Uh, however, we are not yet uh, at a stage where the Central Admissions Office um, and the policy of the universities across the board um, will be uh, on, on a uniform basis uh, to facilitate the, the ease of access. Looking at this from a more strategic level, it is a, a matter of deep concern uh, that we have uh, much more students coming from the south of the island to the north to study than we have flowing in a north to south direction, and there are a number of barriers in that regard. The issue of recognition of our qualifications is only one of a number of issues, and that also includes um, careers advice and also the universities from the south of Ireland uh, actively encouraging ap applications from, uh, from Northern Ireland. Uh, also, the members should be aware that there are different uh, demographic uh, pressures in the two parts of the island, uh, which in the short run may actually exacerbate the current inequity in terms of, of student flows, whereas we have a, a falling population uh, approaching in terms of the university age population, whereas in the south of Ireland the numbers are actually growing. So that uh, creates a pressure in its own, in its own right. Rogers for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, uh, you, you're right, NUI, National Universities of Ireland, are being, being quite proactive at the minute in addressing this issue. Have you uh, any plans to meet with the National Universities to discuss this further? Well, well our, our direct uh, channel of communications uh, is with uh, our counterparts in the Department uh, of Education and Skills in, in the South, and I'm due to have a meeting uh, with my counterpart, Rory Quinn, uh, within uh, the next uh, couple of weeks. I know John O'Dowd will, will be doing uh, similarly. Uh, our officials are also meeting uh, at a senior level between the two departments on, on a regular basis. It is for us then to encourage uh, our colleagues in the South uh, to encourage a change of policy through the, their own uh, uh, arm's length bodies. And and uh, that is something that has been a source of ongoing discussion. It has been a source of great frustration over the past number of years, and uh, a number of members have joined in that frustration at the, the very slow uh, pace of change. Uh, and indeed, um, it, there is, a, I dare say, a very part a partitionist approach taken uh, to higher education on the island of Ireland. Not that I necessarily would broaden it out into that sort of politics, but um, I think there is much more scope for, for progress in this regard, and I don't think we've seen enough happen. And, and, and over the past number of months and years. The Marvin's story for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Following on from all the previous questions in relation to the issue around Strandmillis College, the Minister will be well aware that his own department is currently seeking the reconstitution of members of the Board of Governors of Strandmillis. And given the key role that Board of Governors plays and their other sectors that see the Board of Governors as the gatekeeper of ethos and identity, uh, what guarantees can the Minister give that those that will be appointed 
as Board of Governors to the Strand Millers will be those people who have an interest in and a, a very defined uh, protection of the ethos and identity of Strand Millers College. There are probably two points I need to, to make in, in response to that. I think the first one is to, to again to stress to be cautious about trying to construct uh, an ethos of Stramillis that may be part of the, of the past but does not actually reflect the reality of where the college stands today. The second thing I would stress is that um, the appointments of, of uh, governors uh, to Stramillis, like any other uh, public body, will be, will be fully in line, in line with the code on public appointments. And I do want to stress that w there is not a political test in terms of those appointments, whether that is in terms of what the members said about uh, potential appointees uh, being signed up to the particular ethos uh, of, of Strand Millis, or indeed uh, for potential governors being signed up to any particular thing that I have said uh, over the past uh, number of months in relation to the future of teacher training. Order, time is up.